You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Chagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Body Banter. I am Shegun Yedile. I'm uh, speaking today from Kelowna. That's in uh, the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Silk Okanagan nations. And as usual, I have my co-host with me today, Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Claudia Krebs and I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And we are thrilled to have um, Chloe Angus with us on the podcast today. Welcome, Chloe. Why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Chloe Angus. I um, I'm a fashion designer here in Vancouver, where I grew up on the Sunshine Coast of BC, and I also work and uh, develop design wearable robotic suits. I uh, obviously this is <laughs> a, a necessity that's come up. I'm a T10 complete spinal cord injury survivor. Chloe, you have a very unique relationship to the human body, and I would love for you to share your story. You started out clothing the human body with your fashion designs. Tell us how that started. Well, I was uh, born in a very rural community, Egmont, BC, on the Sunshine Coast, and my family had an organic seafood farm uh, eight and a half miles up Jervis Inlet. So I grew up in an extremely rural setting, and we were off the grid completely, so no TVs, no telephones, and, um, you know, it certainly leaves time to be creative when you're young, and uh, although I grew up in (laughs) what is typically a fishing and and logging uh, type town uh, and wearing gumboots and rain gear, I always had an eye for fashion and a passion for that. And I saw dresses in uh, boat ropes and and skirts and seaweed. So it was always in my brain and uh, growing up and having a small singer sewing machine. It was a hand crank that my grandma had. And uh, I learned how to sew my, you know, my first Barbie collection was, was on that sewing machine. And that passion for fashion and creating clothing um, for the body uh, continued for me as I, as I um, grew up, I ended up going to fashion design school here in Vancouver. I went to the Helen the Faux School of Fashion Design, which was a small European school that taught, um, atelier methods of sewing that I was really interested in. And I wanted to make clothing, Um, but how did I do that from a a very small town and in BC, it's not exactly the fashion hub of the world, let alone Canada even. (laughs) But when you have a passion for something, I think that that is, it just grows when you nurture it. So I had an incredible opportunity to Uh, develop and launch a line with the Bay's Canadian by Design Department in 2004. And that got my career started. It was an incredible place to to get my feeding, uh, you know, my my footing in in fashion. And um, I've been making clothing. Um, My fashion design company is called Chloe Angus Design. And it is uh, based here in Vancouver. I'm all made in Canada and coming from a sustainable organic farming background and going into fashion. um, This is a was a far cry from from what my upbringing was. I was truly going into one of the most polluting um, industries I could possibly look at. And so to make that okay with me and the rest of my family, I always. 
I've always had a company and an eye on sustainability and sustainability, you know, it, across sort of all platforms, the idea of sustainable environment, but also um, sustainable economy and, and having a made in Canada line, but also a sustainable body image. And that was really important to me. I was going into an industry that I saw so challenging from a body perspective for everyone, um, male and female, but but obviously, you know, female was so difficult. It, you know, everybody was, all the models I had to choose from when I called an agency were young and thin and tall and beautiful. And, you know, that I've always said it doesn't take much talent to dress somebody who was already <laughs> young, tall and beautiful. And I, saw beauty and inspiration in all the bodies around me. And I also felt it was really important to be inclusive, particularly in fashion. Um, there wasn't anybody, certainly with, you know, gray hair or over 25 in the modeling industry. You know, if you were asking for somebody in their mid to late 20s that was a size eight, well, that was plus size and, um, and, and considered, you know, uh, older model category. And, and so from an early stage, I really felt it important that everybody who bought my clothes, my customers had a body representation, a, a representation within my line. And that was whether you were, um, you know, I, I've had pregnant models on my runway. I've had plus size models. I've had granny models it, it's you know I've always tried to keep an eye on a realistic and sustainable body type um in, in the industry which when I started out just was a totally radical <laughs> thinking I really love that and um when we talk about the inclusivity of different body types ages shapes sizes gender identities um how did that influence your design process like how did well how did your relationship with the body change over time of designing for these different bodies like how do you how do you clothe all these different bodies well interesting you know i became a body expert and in my own way i can look at somebody and analyze them very quickly and determine the best style i can create for them and and bodies are all about you know, highlighting what makes us feel best and, you know, really hiding the rest. You know, that's what gives people confidence in themselves to go out and and do what they were born to do. Um, but sometimes without the right clothes or feeling good in your skin <laughs> and maybe the clothing over top of that um, can leave people with with a lack of confidence. And it's always something that I have taken time to make sure that I'm fitting people and making them feel their very best. And, and to me, that was the most important thing. It wasn't, you know, yes, I, I wanted to create great style, but it couldn't come at a price of, of body shaming or, you know, just not being inclusive. So for me, it was really important to make comfortable clothing that was also um, fit really, really well to a body. And, and so when I create my lines, I, I think of all of my clients and I make sure that there is a piece or a look, an outfit for each one of those body styles in my line. And, and so that everybody can come in and, and feel welcome and um, not feel like there's something there for them. That's so fascinating, Chloe. Uh, and I, I like the phrase that you started out with, that I became an expert in the human body. And, and that's so fitting um, because it's actually, um, segues into this question that I wanted to ask you about your own story, about your body and the changes uh, that inevitably and unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't, I don't know how you'll tell us now, um, your injury that, that you opened up with when you uh, described yourself as a T10 uh, injured uh, individual, 
how did your concept of the human body evolve uh, uh, when you consider your own body and the changes that happened? Wow, <laughs> now that's a big question and it and it's it's been an ongoing journey. Um, I think like most people with their bodies, but yeah, I went from, you know, walking runways and red carpets and living this glamorous, you know, fashion designer lifestyle, traveling the world. And, you know, in 24 hours, I was in a hospital with the best doctors in our country telling me that I would never walk again and that I'd go and learn to live my life in a wheelchair as a paraplegic. I was floored, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I, like most people who get this news, I think you can hardly breathe or apply it to your life. I didn't see how that was going to be conducive to the lifestyle that I was living, designing clothing, and how was I going to change and adapt with that? It seemed impossible on that first day. Um, and the shock of not walking and, and not being able to access the world around me was, was massive. But as the days continue and I learned more about what it meant to be a paraplegic, to have a spinal cord injury, I learned about the secondary health complications of living seated, of being sedentary, um, of living in a wheelchair, really. And that was much scarier than the idea of not walking. Um, it, it It's a wide range of, of ongoing health complications that um, have a, an ongoing and detrimental impact to my life. So um, muscle atrophy, pressure sores, uh, problems with circulation, bone density loss, problems with bowel and bladder, and intense nerve pain. So this was eye-opening um and I thought this couldn't this couldn't fit to my life the way that I needed it to and I started to search the world for how I could change um my situation what opportunities would be out there for me I'm a fairly innovative person um engineering clothing is what I say and growing up on a very rural organic farm you you tend to grow up and to be innovative so I put my innovative thinking hat on and, and thought you know I, I'll be able to work my way out of this um and that's when it led to I, I got on Google I was still in a hospital I got on Google and I read an article in Popular Science magazine that was about a new wearable robotic suit that was going to help paralyzed people walk again. And well, first of all, I was interested in the wearable suit that got me immediately and that it would help paralyzed people walk. So in my mind, this was the solution. And I remember looking across the room at my husband, who was devastated and in the corner trying to figure out what we were going to do. And I said, oh, honey, don't worry. Just order me one of these off of Amazon. I'll be back at work next week, you know, because to me, it was just about getting back. Um, and that was what was really important. Um, unfortunately, uh, that was 2015 and exoskeleton technology was um, in the early stages. Uh, it was really only available for research. And I certainly couldn't buy one off of Amazon. Um, but it got my mind thinking about some possibilities and about wearable robotics. And if I made pants, then maybe I could just make pants with motors. I love that. Um, you just were like, well, I'm a fashion designer. I design things people can wear. These people make things that walk. Um, so we'll make pants that can walk. It reminds me of Wallace and Gromit. I'm, I'm sure you know that um, uh, movie very well with the walking pants. Um, fast forward, you achieved the goal of actually walking in those pants eventually. So um, last year in 2022, you received the Courage to Come Back Award. Um, congratulations. That's uh, such a deserved honor. and. Um, Tell us about what led up to that award and how you ended up walking in 
Wallace and Gromit's pants. I'm just going to call them that because that's the image that comes to my mind. My my Wallace and Gromit pants. It is now obviously one of my my favorite movies by Wallace and Gromit. Um, and it is the life I, I live and work in now, which is absolutely eye-opening. And, you know, the first time I stood up and walked in a wearable robotic suit, it just blew my mind and it opened my eyes to what was possible and not maybe necessarily possible for my own recovery, but possible with technology. And that was gonna change everything. So once I got that in my sights and after searching the world for a team that would um, help me build a better exoskeleton than what was available, I ended up finding one right here in my own backyard. Um, and that's when I met Dr. Simak Arzenpour and Dr. Ed Park uh, at Simon Fraser University. And they had a concept to build an, an advanced exoskeleton that I wanted. And it was everything I had dreamed of. It, it I wanted it to be uh, independently used. I, I wanted it to be self-balancing. I wanted it to be used in everyday life and outdoors and it would improve my health. And um, finding this incredible team and sticking with them all of these years, we've been at it seven years now, um, to build human in motion robotics and, and the wearable robotic suit that you saw me receive that uh, very honorable Courage to Come Back Award in um, has really changed everything. And once I got that, as I say, once I got that in my sights, I couldn't let it rest. I mean, I have worked every single day to help uh, educate and advocate for wearable robotics and the incredible impact this technology will have on people's bodies and ability to stay healthy, stay active, stay social, stay independent. I mean, these are massive changes for people. So I get out as much as I can. Um, you know, we had to raise a considerable amount of money to raise this child. Um, and it will, uh, you know, it's an ongoing village that will continue to help us do that and including us talking about it today. So that does make a, a, a difference to be here and, and talk to you guys. But the day, what was really important for me and you know, being recognized in the Courage to Come Back Award was just a, a, a great way to sort of show all of the hard work over the years of getting the word out there and, and explaining to people what an exoskeleton is, let alone what we're going to improve it to do. And, and that the needs of, you know, people with motion disability is more than just a wheelchair, you know, um, and it's taken a lot of years, but to have that recognition was a lot. And for me, I remember going back to my team and, and telling them, hey, this is a recognition of all of us, of all of the work we've done together to get to here. And um, at that time, we were just completing our device. We hadn't taken it very far outside of um, our lab yet, but I was determined that by the time I was going to be receiving that award that I would receive it in my exoskeleton. And I'm that was a, a particularly wonderful day from, for me and for our team and everyone who supported us to see me walk up and accept that award standing. It, it was quite something. I, I am sure it was. And I'm so much in awe of you, Chloe, of <laughs> the courage and the, just the determination and the innovation, the, the imagine, like the imagination and everything that it must have taken you working with this team to come to this moment uh, where you got the award. And then since then, I'm sure that a lot of people have been finding inspiration in your work, Chloe. And uh, and I'm just I just wanted to say that I'm sure all of us, uh, Claudia and myself and and B, um, we are very much um, appreciative and very much in awe of all that you've achieved. Uh, so my question going forward is how this then um, has changed your own image of your body, if it has, as well as how this has come to merge with your original passion for fashion design is there like a meeting point like a place where everything is seamless together in at least in your mind i see that day coming i can tell you um and for my own body i mean it was 
it was so traumatic to have this happen to you. Spinal cord injury is one of the most traumatic um, injuries physically and mentally that, that a human being can survive. It is so challenging to only have half of you work and now to look at your body in the mirror and and see it in a different way dress it in a different way you know you, you end up at the rehab center and everybody's there you know in sweatpants and you know velcro shoes and it it was a challenging time for me personally to overcome that and to find my my style to find my way back and you know, lucky for me, I was a fashion designer. So I could just go back to my studio and create what I needed and and to make myself feel myself again. Um, it was very challenging, but it 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 changed my perspective of bodies too and, and my appreciation for them. I I have to say now that um I never loved my legs growing up. They were always a little shorter than I wanted them to be. And I rode horses, so they were sturdy. And um, I should have appreciated that more. And now I sure appreciate working bodies, all of them, every type. If you can step up and down a curb, I think you're awesome. So learning to appreciate my own body um, in a different way for what it can do now Um it's taken some time, but for me, it's really important to stay as active and as able as I can to, to maintain and retain the use that I have, um, whatever that is. So um, I've worked on that, but the change for me is when I get in my exoskeleton and I stand up and I walk all around independently at eye level, I can hug my husband to my chest, I can work out, I can even dance now. That brings my body back to me. You know, I people ask me what it's like and I just say, it's it's just like being myself. And um, to, to have that, mobility back and that motion it just it's so it's so much you you take so much for granted when you have an able body and all I can say to people is you know appreciate what you have today um we're all only aging so we're gonna look back on this moment and think we were in pretty good shape and you know use what you have stay fit stay able stay active and um you know, appreciate that body is always what I'm trying to tell people now. And that certainly, you know, come from my own injury and, and, and that um, situation, that experience. So uh, the Dalai Lama always said, when things are difficult, you can always look at it as a learning experience. And that will be something good you can take out of it. And that certainly, there's been a big learning curve to spinal cord injury and, um, having a mobility uh disability really yeah but okay, so I I would, see, mm, mm, sorry go ahead. i'm sorry um i've been thinking about this play i went to see a little while ago uh, at the Fringe Festival here in Vancouver um, by Amica Hunt. And uh, they uh, put up this play called Anatomica. And uh, the whole premise of it was a, a survey for the audience. What do you think humans should have? An endoskeleton, an exoskeleton, or a third type of sort of hydrostatic um, support system? And um, you know, an hour of this performance, you know, going through all the various advantages and disadvantages. The audience was split between endoskeleton and exoskeleton. Um, so there was no clear vote for endoskeleton. <clears throat> and I'll admit, I voted endoskeleton all the way. But now I'm thinking exoskeleton might just be the way to go, right? Um, despite the challenges that come with an exoskeleton, but um, as a, an able-bodied person whose endoskeleton is working pretty well, um, I didn't have the full appreciation of what an exoskeleton can do for us. Well, you know, that is so true. And what an interesting um, uh, play to see. I, I'm sorry I missed it. Um, 
Yeah. So I often talk about that wearable robotics is the future of all human motion. And that's whether you're building cars or lifting heavy boxes in a warehouse, whether you're someone like me who has had an injury and needs assistance now, or whether, I hate to tell you all this, but you're all going to age and end up with a motion disability. And you're not going to want it either. The wheelchair will not be enough for you. And it shouldn't be. We live in a world where we have autonomous cars and drones to deliver our groceries. Man walked on the moon 50 years ago, yet we're still working on getting a little lady like me to walk on earth today. We have the technology. All we have to do is apply it. And I think we're lucky to be in a time. We've applied it. And this is what's so exciting is that until now, people didn't really have uh, a way to clearly understand what's possible with exoskeletons. And we're at a time where this, this technology is booming. This innovation is huge. And we're so lucky that right here in our town, um, in, in BC, in Vancouver, we're building, we have the world's most advanced wearable technology. And, and that's just incredible. You know, I, I liken it to the space arm, right? It came out of UBC. It was, uh, it's, you know, something that I think all Canadians are proud of that we built the robotic space arm. And I tell people, well, now Canada can be proud that we built robotic legs too. That's <laughs> go ahead, Claudia. <laughs> that's uh, really wonderful and um, such a beautiful way to wrap that up. Um, that story, your story of the exoskeleton, and I think it really shows the power of collaboration across disciplines as well. Um, for the engineers to work together with a fashion designer who has that expertise on the human body and how to dress a human body. Uh, in combination with the lived experience of uh, spinal cord injury, I think it was just sort of, it all came together there uh, beautifully. Well, I, I'm so lucky and so grateful to the team at Human in Motion Robotics for giving me a, the director position for lived experience and to absorb all I put into to building, not just what users want, but what users, I, you know, not just what they need, but what they want. And you know, you asked me earlier about how I see fashion and, and robotics coming together in my world. And one day I look forward to a, a, a runway and a fashion show where all models are wearing exoskeletons. And uh, our exoskeleton is going to come in custom colors and Burberry prints. So it, it's going to be the future is, is fashionable in wearable robotics. There's so many things you've said today that I... I just see like a headline. <laughs> the future is fashionable. <laughs> I just, you know, um, and the, your experience, your lived experience with your own passion for for a fashion design, um, and then your injury, everything has just, I think, um, shaped you into this wonderful, beautiful individual that we see today, and we're we're really honored um, to to be involved in one way or the other with, with your work and with what you do. Um, tell us about, do you hold, do you still do uh, exhibitions? Do you still sh do shows and, um, and where people may be able to find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, collaboration is is so important to me on all levels. Uh, the exoskeleton is one part of it. But in my fashion world, and you guys know this, I'm sure that the collaboration I do with Indigenous artists across Canada is um, such important work to me. And as I said, it was it is my first passion and, and what I love the most. I, wearable robotics is a necessity, but art and fashion is where my love lies. And um, so, of course, you know, we've taken some shifts and some change in the fashion industry since surviving, you know, many years of lockdown and, and COVID. 
So I have an online store now, um, chloeangus.com, where you can go and see the things that I make and collaborate with the artists that I do. And um, we're also about to launch some of my first accessible designs that I've been working on with uh, others here in the industry. So uh, lots to see at Chloe Angus Design coming up in the future. And I'll keep you posted for that uh, exoskeleton fashion show. <laughs> Amazing. And we will definitely post all the links on our website, uh, including a link of a picture of you wearing the exoskeleton. Um, this is body banter. And one of the things we ask all of our guests is, what is your favorite body part? I guess my heart. <laughs> um, it keeps me strong and passionate and makes me love the world I live in. That's so it's, beautiful. I think you made so everyone beautiful. tear up. <laughs> I'm tearing up already, <laughs> Chloe. <laughs> and um, well, we also like to ask, do you have any least favorable parts? <laughs> What's your least favorable body part? Well, I'm having a bit of an argument with my legs right now. <laughs> if they could just wake up and get going again, um, I try and tempt them with very sparkly running shoes, which you'll often see me wear, and trying to tempt them to, to get up and dance again on their own. But, you know, that may be in my future, too. We'll, we'll just keep talking about it. At the moment, I just like to say they're dormant. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Chloe, for sharing your story. What a beautiful arc from fashion designer, understanding, becoming an expert in the human body, then your own health story of having to redefine what living in your body means. Um, and I love that you were still in the hospital. We're talking hours after your injury and you were defiant and said, I am going to walk again. Here's an exoskeleton. Let's get this going. And you have. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's uh, It's been a real journey, and I'm honored to be part of it and, and to be highlighted today to talk about it. And I just want to give others hope that this is coming. The future of wearable robotics is here, and you'll have an opportunity to wear them too. So get out there, have a look, stay active, and be ready for your exoskeleton. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.